Um, you know, we're, we're talking about music's effect on you, which, of course, is important. Um, I want to read a couple things to you. I, I found this. This is interesting. Uh, here are some little-known effects of music on the body. Uh, little-known effects of music on the body. All right. Um, let's see here. Um, number one. Music stuns the savage beast. You say, what does that mean? There's a scientific reason why the most stunning bands in history were also the loudest. All right? Uh, a study found that listening to music at 95 decibels can reduce your mental and physical reaction times by 20%. So you're only 80%. I'll catch it. Go ahead. Boom. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Um, but uh, basically what you're seeing there is you're only 80% of what you could be uh, when the music is louder than it ought to be. And uh, I, I won't go into all the different, uh, uh, some, some facts that I learned, but, but it's really interesting because the way God made your ear, the way God made your, your, your mind to work, um, I couldn't, without an amplifying system, I could not yell loud enough to hurt your ears. Without amplification, is this on, brother? All right, let's so make sure Brother Stephen, he was looking at me. Um, uh, without amplification, um, you really would not, there's no way to hurt your ears. We could have literally a thousand people in here. I know you know we can't fit them all in here, but let's say we could pack this place out, get two hundred people in here, sing at the top of our lungs. You could not hurt your ears. It's not humanly possible. It's only until which time you add amplification. All right, and I'm not saying that amplification is of the devil in and of itself. All right, but when you add music and especially the wrong kind of music to, and amplify it, man, you can really do some damage. Uh, here's another one: when the volume goes up, so do the drink sales. You ever wonder why when you go to a restaurant, you want to have a nice meal with your family, and you have to ask them, hey, do you, do you mind? And, you know, they look at me like, you're not 75. What's wrong with you, you know? And, and I'm like, I just want to be able to enjoy a meal with my family, and I have to yell at them across the table, hey, I'm paying for this experience, right? I mean, I don't want to have to, you know, yell at my family so they can hear me. But when the volume goes up, so do drink sales, all right? Uh, here's another one uh, about uh, uh, this one's uh, another point. It's called you don't dance. Yeah, right. <laughs> the human heart will automatically try to synchronize its beat with the tempo of a song. Did you know that? So when the tempo of the song is too fast, guess what that does to you? All right? And they've done studies before with plant life and things like that. Um, here's another thing. I don't know if you guys know this or not, but about two years ago, um, well, anybody remember from the 80s, Manuel Noriega, the Panamanian dictator that we, that we ran out of there? You guys remember that? You know what we did? We blared rock music. That's what we did outside of his barracks to drive the guy crazy for, so he turned himself in. All right? Uh, how about this? Recently, they had, uh, a couple years ago, they had these Somali pirates. And uh, you know what the British Navy did? Music. They have a, they, have a, 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 uh, they call it, I forget what they call it, but it's actually a, a weapon, technically, that it's, a, it's called non-lethal. Okay? But basically what it does, it brings people to their knees because it, it transmits sound at a level that you really can't, the naked ear doesn't even understand what's going on. And these guys are going, stop, 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 you know? And they, 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 they basically had to surrender, right? So what some people call entertainment, we can use for warfare. Isn't that something? All right, that shows you the power of music and volume, all right? Uh, let me see a couple other things here. Um, uh, da, 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 da. All right. No, I won't, I won't read some, some of these things are really not as intrinsic to what we're talking about in our study, so I'll pass. Um, but we're talking about music's effect on your, 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 your body, your mind, all right, and your spirit. And we talked about, uh, uh, in essence, what uh, Saul went through. Um, we'll go ahead and go through your Old Testament, 2 Chronicles chapter number 5. 2 Chronicles chapter 5. We want to talk about the effects of good worship, and we're going to talk about what worship is. Then we're talking about the attraction of worship. And then we're going to talk about styles of worship. All right, and hopefully by the end of this, the idea is going to be that you can at least draw a line. Now, here's what some people may want me to do, and, and I'm going to try to avoid uh, uh, doing this so specifically because when, when a preacher tries to be so specific or, or anyone expounding on the subject of music so specific about this, what they end up doing is they end up leaving a lot of other doors open. I don't want to do that. So I'm going to give you some principles to think about, but I, I hope at the end of this you can draw a line. And what marks our generation, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is that nobody wants to draw a line. 
And oftentimes when a line is drawn, and we've seen that recently even in foreign affairs, you draw, you know, there's a line, don't cross this line. Then they cross it. What do you do? Nothing. Well, don't, it's the same thing we do with kids, right? Hey, what I tell you, one, two, and they know that you could count to 30 and you still wouldn't do something, right? All right, we need to learn to draw lines in our life. That is good for us. It's healthy, all right? Uh, so let's talk about the effects of good worship. Second Chronicles 5, and I think we, we uh, ended up here last week. But I, again, just consider this. Music, all right, uh, music is going to have an effect on you, good or bad. Uh, you cannot say that it does, it's just neutral. It doesn't have a neutral effect on you. Uh, music's going to do something for you, good or bad. Second Chronicles chapter 5, this is, again, talking about uh, worship. We're t- getting into a different area. All right? The reason I say we're getting into a different area is because um, not every time that worship is mentioned in the Bible is music involved. Understand that. Sometimes we worship without music. All right? Now, we are going to look at where music is involved, and this is one of those places. All right, and some things that we can learn as a pattern for our own lives. All right, Second Chronicles five, uh, verse number twelve. Also, the Levites. This is again the 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 blessing and the dedication of the temple. And you know what we ought to desire for our homes, for our families, for our church. Man, we ought to desire a good spirit. Amen. An excellent spirit in this place. And and what 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 allows that? Something that contributes toward that, anyways, is the right kind of music. All right, true worship. Also, the Levites, which were the singers, all of them of Asaph, of Heman, of Jeduthun, with their sons and their brethren, being arrayed in white linen, having cymbals and psalteries and harps, stood at the east end of the altar, and with them 120 priests sounding with trumpets. All right, so we have different kinds of uh, instruments there. Again, in uh, verse 12, you have percussion, string, wind. All right. Verse 13, it came even to pass as the trumpeters and, singing, and singers were as one to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. I can't stress this enough. One of the qualities of good music as it relates to worship is there's unity. All right? You don't have, uh, and, and again, uh, unity is not disrupted by good harmony. You'd have melody, you'd have harmony to accompany that, to complement it, and there's nothing wrong with rhythm as long as it's not taking the song away. All right? Um, there, there's nothing wrong with, uh, again, think about this. On Jordan, stormy banks I stand and cast a wishful eye. That's a march beat. Nothing wrong with a drum. But you better make sure it's not the wrong kind of beat. It's not taking you to start, you know, start making you do the, the bumps and the grinds. Okay? All right? We don't need that in church. has no place in church. All right? So, uh, again, you have one sound. There's unity. One of the common traits of, of music in our generation, whether it's secular or Christian, is that oftentimes there's a lack of unity. You've got sometimes something that sounds like the screaming of people in the background. You've got someone that, that's singing a, a uh, uh, the, the, supposed to be the melody, and you can hardly follow that. Then you've got the music itself, and the music is disrupting oftentimes from the, the words that someone's even trying to say. It's sort of chaotic. It's chaos. And again, when you think about how God works, you know, God saw that there was darkness upon the face of the deep, and it was without form and void. So you know what he does? He brings structure to it. All right, God didn't leave it that way. All right, same thing with music. Look at verse 13. All right, they made one sound to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. All right, so there's praise and thanksgiving. And it says, and when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music and praised the Lord saying, for he is good. Notice again that they lifted up their voice. Now sometimes, uh, Brother Joel or any song leader will try to encourage the congregation to sing loudly, all right? And uh, that's not, you know, using a bully pulpit. That's to remind you, hey, here's what we're doing. We are here to praise God. And as much as we put a lot of effort into our jobs, into all these other things, give it your best, all right? That's something that's found in, in good worship. They lifted up their voice. And again, in verse 13, you see at the end of the verse, they're not just praising God because they said we praise the Lord. All right? They're praising God with what they're actually saying. So it shows you that the words are important. All right? So it's not just the music. It's both. All right? They're, They're both important. For he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. That Then the house was filled with a cloud, even the house of the Lord. Notice that the glory of God filled the house. That's what we ought to desire as well. All right? Uh, now let's talk about the association of worship. And again, 
It's more than just about music. Music is used in worship, but music does not equate worship. All right? um, so let's talk about what, what is associated with worship in the Bible. Genesis chapter 22. Genesis 22, this is the first time the word worship is found in the Bible. And uh, you've, you've heard this before. And you ought to, many of you probably know this by now, the law of first mention. The first time something's mentioned in the Bible will, will carry with it a significance associated with where you found it first in the Bible. And worship is no different. Genesis 22, and look at verse number 5. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. Now, I'll give you a million bucks if you can find the worship band that went with him up the mountain. Or if you can find the instrument that he took with him for that matter. All right? There, there's not a musical instrument found. There's not a worship band found. He's telling everybody else, stay put. It's just me and my son going up the hill. Right? So what that tells you is that there, there's no, at least from Scripture, unless you infuse something in there that's not there, there's no music involved. All right? So what are they going to do that they call worship? Look at uh, verse 6. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son. Aren't you glad when you crouch to your father? That's what he always says. Amen. Here am I. Thank God for that. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? So what you learn from this is that worship is associated with sacrifice. All right? So, in and of itself, understand that, that and I, I want to start with this because it's really important, because a lot of people will, will, when they look at what the Bible has to say about the principles of music and what we're talking about, they'll go, well, I just don't like some of the music that we sing in our church. I didn't grow up with it, all right? It, it, it sounds like something from 100 years ago. Uh, you, know what I, you know what my first thought is? We'll learn to sacrifice a little bit. It's not comfortable. Maybe it's, it's unique. Was it comfortable for you the first time you handed out a gospel track? Was it comfortable the first time you tried to open your mouth for Jesus Christ? You know what it was? It was a sacrifice on your part to put your flesh down to be a living sacrifice to the Lord. That's what it was. And when it comes to, to real worship, it ought to be that way. Hey, here's an example. You have a bad week. You, know, you and your, your spouse, you get in an argument. Uh, you got a problem with another brother or sister in Christ. And you come to church and you go, okay, it's time to worship. How do I do this? I have to learn to put my flesh down. Amen. If, you're, if you think for one minute that every single time a pastor gets behind the pulpit, man, he's just excited to be there, and he can't, there's no problem in his life, and he can't wait just to give everything. That's not the case. But you've got to learn to put your flesh down. You know what Abraham had to do? He had to learn to say, I will die to myself and my own desires. If that means I give up my son, then I give up my son. And God looked at that and said, that's worship. God was pleased with it. All right? So again, the Bible uh, 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 defines worship, it associates worship with sacrifice. Let me ask you, when's the last time that you sacrificed to the Lord in worship? You know, and here's another example. I, I, everybody's different. We're all different. We all have our thing, right? For some people, it may be a huge sacrifice to say, amen. And some of you go, well, I don't get, that's not a sacrifice for me. Maybe not. Maybe your thing is to sing louder. Well, I have, oh, I'm okay with that. Maybe your thing is to, to, to give more during the time of offering. That's called worship as well, guys. All right? The Lord beheld them as they gave. That's part of worship. So my, my point is this. We all have something that we, we don't necessarily like to do when it comes to giving ourselves to the Lord, and that's why it's called sacrifice. John chapter 4. Go there. John chapter 4. Two elements should be found in worship as well that I think you would find in 2 Chronicles chapter 5, when the glory of the Lord filled the house. Guys, I, I don't know about you. I, I, I think about what I, what I read, an illustra or I read to you an illustration about a, a Japanese missionary last week. And, and, and it bothers me when I think about what he said. He says, I don't want to just be normal. You know, do you understand what I mean by that? I don't mean I just want to be a freak or I, you know, I don't just be a, a total weirdo. I don't mean that, but I just I, I, I want God to do something. I want God to do something today in our church. I want God to break hearts today. I want God to call someone to the ministry today. I want uh, someone to get saved today. I want to see God move. I want that. And, 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 and when we come to church, it shouldn't just be, okay, all right, time to grab the hymnal. 
Man, there should be some prayer. There should be some thought. There should be some, okay, Lord, I'm ready to sacrifice. That's what worship is, John chapter 4. And there's two elements you'll find here in John 4 that I believe you would have found there in 2 Chronicles chapter 5. John 4, verse number uh, 20. And this is the Lord speaking with the woman of uh, Samaria. And uh, she says, Our fathers worshipped in this mountain. And ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Understand, you can have a worship service in your car going down the road on the highway. All right? That's a great thing to do when you have 30 minutes to kill in a drive. And it's getting frustrated with the people in front of you and around you, and they're stupid, uh, you know, not using their blinker, and getting in front of you and then slamming on the brakes. All things that aggravate you, all right, maybe be a great time to worship the Lord. It'll help you out a little bit, all right? But it says here uh, that and the Lord's leaning toward, he's getting towards something, that worship is not just defined by where you're physically at. Now, there's no doubt when God's people gather, there should be that, that worship found. But he says this, you worship, you know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews, but the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship Him. You know what's interesting? When you, you should highlight that. When it mentions that God's looking for something, that's important. God who sees everything seeks certain things out. You know why? Because they're not, they're not commodities. They are precious and they're rare. To find someone and to find a group of people that want to worship Him in spirit and in truth. All right? And he says here in verse 24, he reiterates it, God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Now, let me tell you right now what I think happens in a lot of independent fundamental Baptist churches. We got the truth down part. We got, we got that, that, the truth part down. All right? When it comes to the spirit, man, sometimes it is lacking. Amen. All right? And it's about as dry as cracker juice. You know, it's, it's like, you know, it's terrible. You know, why is that? Well, why is it that sometimes, think about this, you come to church, and then you just go, man, it is great. Man, the scene is great. Uh, it just seems like the Lord's ready to do something. And sometimes you come in, it just feels like you're fighting something the entire time. All right? That is more related to the spirit part than it is truth. We've got truth here, guys. The question is, do we have this right spirit about us? All right? Now, on the flip side, let me tell you where I think a lot of modern Christianity is at. They desire to serve God. They want to do something. But they don't have the right Bible. No one's taught them. They don't know what truth is. When it comes to worship, when it comes to music especially, they make up the rules as they go. All right? And so we want to have both. And you can have both. You don't have to sacrifice one for the other. The idea that you do is not, is not biblical. All right? Now, I listed out some other places all right, where, um, and again here it says, most references to worship do not include mention of music. It's true. You'll find this all throughout the Bible. Look at Luke chapter number 4. Go there real quickly. Luke chapter 4. A lot of verses. You got Joshua 5, 14, 1 Samuel 1, 3, 1 Samuel 15, 2 Kings 5, 2 Kings 17, Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. And uh, I want you to see this. This is where the Lord is tempted by the devil. And I want you to see something in verse 7. If thou therefore wilt worship me, all shall be thine. Where was the music? Who was singing? Nobody. Where was the worship? The worship was involved in humbling one party to the other. If he would bow down, all right, if the Lord Jesus would have bowed down to the Satan and thank God that he did not, amen, he resisted that temptation. But if he had, he would have been worshiping Satan. With no music involved. All right? So what that shows you again is, that, again, oftentimes throughout the Bible, when you find the word worship, music's not involved. All right? Now that said, look at Psalm chapter 66. It doesn't mean that that's always the case either. On the flip side, music is uh, uh, utilized, and God accepts music within the right context as part of worship. Psalms uh, 66. And look, if you would, this is a... Uh, millennial psalm. You say, what do you mean by that? This is when Jesus Christ is reigning on the earth. And we've learned this in the book of Psalms that oftentimes the things you read in Psalms are not just relating to past in David's life, but also things that are still to come. Look at verse 1. Make a joyful noise unto God, all ye lands. There's the earth. Sing forth the honor of His name. Make His praise glorious. 
Say unto God, How terrible art thou in thy works? Through thy greatness of thy power shall thy enemies submit themselves unto thee. Now notice, what are the people in the, in the world, in the earth doing? They are singing. They are making a joyful noise through singing. And look at verse 4. All the earth shall worship thee and shall sing unto thee. They shall sing to thy name, Selah. Come and see the works of God. You know what our, our music ought to do? It ought to be inviting for other people to come and see what God's doing. That's what, music, that's what our music ought to do. It ought to invite the Christian that's backslidden and is, is weary and, it, and is searching to get right and knows that there's something that's missing in their life and they have in the back of their mind, they know it's the Lord. And rather than coming to church and going, man, what happened to these people? They're about as dead as I am. And I haven't been in church in years. They ought to come and go, man, this is what I've been missing. This is what's missing right here. All right? Hey, for that person that's lost and comes to visit our church, and they go, man, these people are shouting. They're saying, amen. This is a little bit weird, but it sure seems like they mean it. It sure seems like something is real and genuine in their life. That'd be a good thing. That'd be a good thing. Come and see the works of God. But notice again in verse 4, worship is connected with singing. All right? So there's the association of worship. Let me talk about the attraction of worship. All right? Look at Exodus chapter 34. God is attracted to worship. Unfortunately, unfortunately, Satan is as well because he wants it. But look at Exodus chapter 34. And it would be a great study to do. We don't have time to do it this morning. But if you looked at every place where worship shows up, you know what worship is? Worship is sacrifice. Worship is, is humbling yourself and yielding yourself to something else. You know, some Christians worship their jobs. Some Christians worship their houses. Some Christians worship their car. Some Christians worship their families. All right? What do we really worship? That's a good question. Now look at Exodus 34 and verse number 14. For thou shalt worship no other god. For the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God. You say, what is he talking about? He's talking about the idols and the images that will be found in the lands that they're about to go in and, and conquer. And the Lord desires our worship exclusively for him. He's attracted to that. That's why when they, the, the singing and the instruments were as one, and man, it's, it's not just a matter of saying, we praise you, we praise you, we praise you. We praise you. Just saying we praise you over and over isn't necessarily praising the Lord. You understand that, okay? Sometimes it, it's, it's engaging biblical words with thanksgiving. You know what they're saying? He is good. His mercy endureth forever. And as they sang that, and as the music was, was with them as one, the Lord said, I want to dwell in that. I want to be a part of that. I enjoy that. Lord's attracted to that. All right? Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. Matthew 4, and again, looking at the temptation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Aren't you glad he didn't crack even one time? You ever think about how many temptations you face on a daily basis? Temptation to think the wrong thing, say the wrong thing, act the wrong way, you know, harbor, harbor uh, uh, um, uh, anger towards someone, whatever. All the temptations that are a part of our life, and he didn't do it one time. Praise the Lord. Matthew 4, look at verse number uh, uh, 9. And this is uh, the devil again speaking to the Lord. And saith unto him, All these things will I give, me, give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Satan desires worship. So worship is a very powerful thing. And when you combine worship with music, man, it becomes that much more powerful. All right? Again, we remember the Bible says, the Lord tells us, take heed what you hear, and then take heed how you hear. All right? Uh, very, very, very important. So Satan desires it. Look at Revelation chapter 13. Understand that what the world is getting ready for, and they don't know it, all right, but what they're getting ready for, and uh, I, again, I, I, you'll have to forgive me. I've been reading a lot of books on World War II. I'm starting a new one on Patton, uh, Killing Patton by, uh, they say Bill O'Reilly. I don't think he writes anything. I think he just puts his name on it, has someone else write the stuff for him, makes a lot of money. But uh, really interesting you know, the reason, uh, and I watched a documentary called The Dark Charisma of Adolf Hitler. Um, the reason I believe that Adolf Hitler was so successful um, in what he did in, in getting everyone to follow him was two things. He told the people what they wanted to hear. He did. He told German people, you're the best. No one is better than you. You don't need help from anybody. We can do this on our own. 
Now, look, as an American, you know what you want to hear? You're the best. No one else can do it better than you. Now, there's a sense of nationalistic pride that comes with that. And I'm an American. My dad served in the military. But you know, watch out for that. When you start feeling, yeah, 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 I am. I am the best. Watch out for that, okay? All right? He was real good about telling them what they wanted to hear. The other thing was this. He never really laid out any specifics for anything. In all of his speeches, he never did. You know what that did? That kept the people in the dark. But they were so desperate to find someone that would help them gain power in the world again and get their economy going again. You'd be real careful with that kind of thing, politically speaking, especially in the political season in which we find ourselves. All right? Again, you know what's going to happen in the, in the tribulation? The world's going to be starving for someone to lead them and take them out of the mess that they're in. In steps the Antichrist. Revelation 13, look at verse number 8. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life with the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If any man have an ear, let him hear. All right? Uh, again, he says, all the world is going to worship him. Look at verse 12. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him and causeth the earth, this is the false prophet, and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. What are they doing? They are worshiping him. Look at verse 15. He had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Why am I looking at all this? Because the point is, the Lord is not the only one that wants worship. And, and sometimes, I know this could be a statement that could be taken a lot of different ways, sometimes what people think they're doing in worshiping the Lord is not worshiping Him but someone else. You've got to be careful. You have to be careful. All right, uh, look at Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5. When you take the act of worship and you cover, uh, couple it with music, it's very, very powerful. And I'll tell you, the Bible talks about the power of God and the salvation, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's very powerful, amen? It can break our chains, it can set us free, it can transform us, it can renew us, it can make us a new creature in Christ. Thank God for the power of the Lord. Uh, I think about the things that God has done in your life through His power. Thank God for that, all right? But understand that not all power comes from the Lord. Mark 5, look at verse 5. Here's the maniac of Gadara. Uh, and it says here, or verse 4, Because he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. And always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs crying and cutting himself with stones. He was powerful. Nobody could tame him. Tame him. They put chains on him, and he would break the chains. That's supernatural. That wasn't normal. All right? Why am I saying that? Because a lot of what is considered to be worship today, it is powerful, and it will move you, <laughs> and it'll, it'll stir you emotionally, but it doesn't necessarily translate to worshiping God. It's powerful, but it's not the right power. And just because something moves you, and just because you like the way that it makes you feel, doesn't mean that it's right. All right? I want to read some, some things to you. American churchgoers no longer sort themselves out by denomination. You could also fill that in by saying doctrine. So much as by musical preference. That's the truth. Now, this is not written you know, necessarily by a Bible-believing, you know, independent Baptist, uh, Bible-thumping preacher. This is a guy from Notre Dame University, okay? Right, he's just making an observation about our society. When one chooses a musical style today, one is making a statement about who, uh, whom one identifies with, what one's values are, and ultimately who one is. That's why when it comes to us talking about, hey, be careful what you consider to be worship. Because eventually that sort of defines who you are. They're, 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 I'm not, this is not a, a Bible-believing preacher saying this. For all I know, this guy may not even be a saved person. He's just writing about music and what he sees in churches today. All right? Now, if you're going to listen to music, please don't be that guy. All right? Uh, what does your music or your worship say about you? Again, this is Michael Hamilton uh, um, continuing the thought he has. The kind of music a church offers increasingly defines the kind of person who will attend. Because for this generation, music is at the very center of self-understanding. You know why some people will or will not come to our church? Music. You know why some people go to another church and they love it? 
I, I, I use this illustration, and I maybe um, hopefully it doesn't fall on deaf ears because I've used it before. I'll never forget when I was with uh, Pastor Paul somewhere in, in, this guy, in Tennessee, and this guy was talking about how great his church was. And uh, he says, man, our church is up, because he finds out. It's funny how a lot of times Christians, and I, I'm not trying to be critical, but you'll find this to be true. When you open your mouth for Jesus Christ, and all of a sudden everybody around you is a Christian. You ever notice that? Oh, yeah, I go to church, you know, and hey, why don't you ever open your mouth, you know? Uh, but at least they open their mouth at some point, and that's good. And, and so they'll tell you, oh, man, our, my church is great. I love it. Well, what's so great about it? And I don't forget that this guy said, our worship is awesome. He said, the music is amazing. He said, I love the music. I love it. It's just awesome. He just saying awesome, awesome, awesome. Everything's awesome. And Pastor Paul goes, well, what about the preaching? He's like, well, he said, we, he said well, we're working on that. <laughs> Literally, those were his words. I'm not making it up. We're working on that. All right? So what does that tell you? A lot of people don't necessarily go to church because they, they were hungry for teaching and the preaching of the Word of God. Or maybe there is inside of them, because the Holy Spirit is there, they know they need that. But they sacrifice some of that for what they're comfortable with. When you play music, you also embrace a style. Think about this, guys. With whatever music you listen to. A style suggests ways to sit, ways to sing, ways to feel rhythm. A style also suggests ways to think. A style even defines a musical community, a group with shared notions about music and its purpose. Here's a, you know, independent fundamental Baptist pastor, Edward Rothstein, chief music critic for the New York Times. All right, this is not a, this is not a saved guy, all right, talking about how you shouldn't listen to certain kinds of music. This is someone making an observation about music and its effect in your life. So the question is, where's the line in the sand? Now, there's some people who say, all right, preacher, well, you're saying all this stuff. Where's the line? My, my question in return is, would you be willing to use it if you found it? Yeah. Will you draw a line? Right? You, you have to do that yourself for your, for your family, for your kids, for your church. Don't think that if you're filling your head with stuff that isn't led by the Spirit of God and you come to church that it won't affect people around you. It does. Look at Exodus chapter 32. Exodus 32. I like this uh, particular story. We actually have a hymn that we sing, a song that we sing called, Who is on the Lord's Side? And uh, it's a great question, great song. And uh, the reason that we sing it is a good reminder that uh, there is a side that is the Lord's. Understand that. All right? The Lord is not sitting in no man's land in neutral territory going, well, you know, I'm just, I'm in the middle here, guys. God has always picked a side. And his side's always right. And his side always wins in the end. You might as well get on his side. Amen? That'd be a good place to be. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, what you have here in this story is Moses is coming back down the mountain. And uh, he's hearing the people play music and dance. And Joshua, being the young man that he is, being gullible. You know, I'll tell you this. Young pastors are real gullible. And you say, well, you're, uh, yeah. You tend to think initially everybody's in it for the right thing. And they're not. You tend to just give every, and, and it's not always that way. It's just the way it is. And Joshua being the young guy, he's like, yeah, man, they're, they're fighting. We need to go help. And Moses is going, no, 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 no. There's a party going on down there, right? And so what ends up happening is in verse, 20, or verse 25, when Moses saw that the people were naked, for Aaron had made them naked unto their shame among their enemies. Now, what was associated with that nakedness? Go back to verse number... 17, when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said to Moses, there is a noise of war in the camp. And he said, it is not the voice of them that shout for mastery, neither is it the voice of them that cry for being overcome, but the noise of them that sing do I hear. All right? Uh, look, if you would, at, uh, oh, let's see here. Uh, verse number uh, 26 now. So the people are singing, they're dancing, and then furthermore, the clothes come off. I can tell you this much. No one has ever wanted to take off their clothes to, this is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. You know why? There's some structure to it. There's a melodic flow to it. It's not just, you know, just getting you riled up. And 
I, I, there are some places, and I'm not trying to be critical, but I'm trying to get you to understand why it is that this stuff just doesn't jive. Why some Christian rock concerts you go, and you go, this is Christian. And, and hey, look, I'm not judging the book by its cover, but, man, I don't see how that exemplifies the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ changing you against the world for anything. It doesn't. You look just like him. You act just like him. You talk just like him. You're just throwing the name of God and Jesus in there every once in a while. But man, this music is no different than the world's. Something's wrong there. My question is, do you draw a line in the sand? Look what he says in verse 26. And Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. This morning, if I, could, if I could help you at all today, I would say you need to draw a line in the sand. Based on what we've looked at so far, and we're not done with this study, but we're getting towards the end. Based on what we've looked at for the last couple months, draw a line in the sand and don't cross it. All right? And, and don't allow uh, cute little things that come up. Oh, man. You know what happens sometimes? You'll see something in a movie and go, oh, I wonder what that song is. Then you go look it up, and before you know it, you're listening to that song over and over and over. They'll do that with kids' movies. You've got to be careful. Now, I wanna, I'll play something for you because... I want you to get an idea of what I'm talking about here. Uh, I, I, I went and I looked up the top 40 song, Christian songs for 2015. And uh, this was one of them. I'm going to rush through some of this because it's dramatic. Someone's walking on the sand. There's the sea going back and forth. So I'll get through some of that. What I want is to get what I got somehow. Giving up, letting go of control right now. Giving up, letting go of control. Blind, but I can see. God, how I believe. I can push back the mountain. I can stand on the waves. I want to go deeper. I'm a believer. A believer in what? Now, I, I, you get sometimes that I, I'm, you know, being sarcastic, but I'm not. I'm trying to, I'm asking a question. What are you believing in? I can push back the mountain. I can stand on the waves. I can, you're a believer in you. Here's another one. This one is entitled, Love Alone is Worth the Fight. Now, I listened to it twice, which was painful, but I listened to it twice because I wanted to see, okay, if at some point, you know, we get into the, the, the gospel. Is it at least going to talk about the Bible or the Lord Jesus Christ? Or... Oh, again, this goes on for way too long. Love alone is worth the fight. Yeah, Switchfoot. They said they're not a Christian band. When they can make money off of Christian suckers, they will. 21st century institution. It's sort of the same thing over and over, and it doesn't mention Jesus Christ by name. I don't remember even hearing God's name, to be honest with you, and listen to it twice. I could be wrong, but I don't remember hearing it. So you, you listen to that, and you go, okay, this is what is considered top 40 Christian music in 2015. Let me ask you a question. Did it start there? Someone had to open the door to changing what was once biblically considered worship. 
Carmen from the 80s. Yeah. I want you to maybe get it. Let's listen to this for a second, okay? Now, someone that doesn't know music say there's no rhythm to that. Yeah, there is. You get the idea, all right? But you understand why someone that's listening to Switchfoot comes into a church like ours and goes, what in the world is going on, right? Well, the feeling's sort of mutual, in all honesty. Uh, and, and I'm not saying, oh, man, we're better than that. That's not the point. The point is you can't substitute, man, something that is sound and something that is clean. It just feels like, man, just it feels clean. I don't know how else to say that. I, I wish I could... Say it better, more, a better way to say that. I, I can't think of it. It's clean, though. You compare it with what we just listened to. It doesn't, it's not the same at all. All right? So, again, I'll encourage you this morning. Draw a line in the sand for your music. Let's go ahead and uh, close in a word of prayer. Brother, uh, let's see here. Brother Joel, if you would close.